You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome. The History of the Great War premium episode number 23. The First World War would be defined by artillery. More than any other arm, it would reach unbelievable heights of importance, size, and ability during the war. However, with, even with this importance, which nobody would dispute, it often fades into the background of history. This is something I am as guilty of as anybody else. Artillery on the World War I scale is remarkably hard to pr- properly describe in words. There was a constant shell fire over the front during engagements, but you can't talk about artillery all the time, since, it was doing, since what it was doing was quite boring. So in my episodes, it is often just relegated to a section where I explain what is going to happen with the artillery on the effects that it would have, and then I don't often mention it again for the rest of the episode. In many larger histories, the situation can be even worse, with page after page not having a single piece of discussion about the artillery. These episodes, hopefully, will go some way to fixing that problem. We're going to have three episodes on artillery that I'm calling Preparation, Adaptation, and Refinement. We will be covering preparation today, which means the years leading up to the war. It would be during these years that the artillery of all sides would be built up and the doctrines for its use would first be developed. Overall, it was typified by a very 19th century mindset, with the role of artillery being secondary and the guns often firing over open sights at enemies that were easy to see and hit. To find out what they had planned, we will take each nation in turn. We will start with Germany, then jump to the British, and then to the French. We will then cover the events of the war in the next two episodes. The German military often gets a lot of credit for its artillery during the First World War, and much of this credit is given to the larger amounts of heavy artillery that the Germans had in their army during the early parts of the war. This then made their artillery as a whole far more effective. However, this presence of heavy artillery was not due to some great tactical insight into the future where heavy howitzers would reign supreme on the battlefield. It was instead down to two very simple reasons that would have several follow-on effects. The first of these was simple. The German armament manufacturer Krupp had a large amount of influence in the government. They lobbied for and received large contracts to build some of the largest guns in the world and to build many other large artillery pieces as well. These larger guns were not completely without merit, though. They did have a key part in German war plans. And this brings us to the second reason for these large guns, the Belgian forts. The Schlieffen plan demanded that the German army quickly dispatch the Belgian forts, like Liège and Maubourge, after which they could go charging into northern France. The Germans were not dumb. They knew that to take these forts in a timely fashion, they needed large guns, a need that would result eventually in the creation of such masses, p- massive pieces as the 420 millimeter howitzer, nicknamed Big Bertha. These guns did perform well against the forts, even if they did not fall quite as fast as the Germans had hoped, a problem that was down more to the men defending it than to the guns assaulting them. The critical piece is that the Germans did not plan on using these large guns for anything other than the forts, and in fact they didn't plan on using any huge guns during the battles. In the planning and preparation for these attacks, the Germans had to spend a good amount of time thinking about how to hit targets, though, uh, especially with artillery that was beyond the visual range of their targets, or in direct fire. They also had to figure out how to use and properly coordinate the fire of all of their artillery against these fortifications. Both of these skills would pay dividends in the war almost immediately. Just by having the discussions and then having to develop tactics and command and control systems around these very large groups of very large guns was an important leg up in 1914. However, and I cannot stress this enough, What the Germans thought the war would look like, and what they thought they would need to do with their artillery after they broke through the Belgian forts, almost perfectly mirrored what the British and French were planning for. 
Outside of these siege guns, almost the entirety of the German artillery doctrine revolved around mobility and deploying guns faster during maneuvers. The guns were expected to be right up in the thick of it, providing close support for the infantry, firing over open sights when needed. This thinking was just as wrong as everybody else's. The Germans did have some pretty good advantages right from the jump. Uh, first of all, they had more guns than the French, with each division having roughly a third more field guns than French divisions. This was not a big advantage, though. The big advantage revolved around the 105mm howitzer that each German division had a battalion of. The gun was the best light howitzer in the world at this point, and the French and British did not have anything like it. This was good for the Germans, since their field guns, the 77mm, was objectively worse than the French 75 and the British 18-pounder, being both heavier, less accurate, and slower firing. The Germans also had two less tangible advantages. The first was that the German artillery command structure was always more centralized and separated from the infantry. This made it easier for the guns to transition higher and higher up the chain of command to allow for greater and greater concentrations and flexibility in 1914. The second was the emphasis that German artillery officer training put on tactics and theory. There was a lot of focus on learning rather than just on specific technology that was being used at the time. And this would help them to adapt faster once the war started and technology started to grow in leaps and bounds. These last two benefits were only marginally useful during the first year of the war, and they did not represent a huge advantage at the time, but as the war kept going, they would become more and more pronounced. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. The British had some issues when it came to their artillery, and it all started with the positioning of the artillery in the British military hierarchy. The artillery was divided into the Royal Horse Artillery, the Royal Field Artillery, and the Royal Garrison Artillery. The Garrison Artillery was seen as a lesser service and was mostly neglected before the war. It was also seen as a lower branch because it rarely interacted with other military arms, or even the other groups of their artillery, really. It also never went on campaign with the army, limiting the amount of experience that its men could gain, which in turn limited the amount of promotions they could receive. While this promotion problem was felt the worst by the garrison artillery, it was also a problem for the artillery units as a whole. It could take decades to rise through the ranks, and this meant that the best, most ambitious candidates often shied away from the artillery, and it also meant that there was less innovation, since it took longer for a young officer to get into a position where they could begin to influence policy, by which point they were sort of indoctrinated to how things were done. This was true before the start of the Boer War, and it would be the same after. However, during the Boer War, the artillery had some experiences that would change how they prepared for future conflicts. A key change that was brought into the fold after the Boer War, a colonial war that in hindsight had very little common with future European conflicts, 
was the belief that shrapnel was the most important type of ammunition for the artillery to have. Shrapnel, as opposed to high explosives, was really good at killing large groups of exposed infantry. In essence, the shrapnel shell made the artillery feel like cannons that fired really big grenades. For the decade before the war, the British would continue to believe that shrapnel was the way forward, and so when they would arrive on the battlefields of 1914, their guns would be equipped mostly with shrapnel shells. The only problem with this scheme was that as soon as the Germans came under fire, they would often dig some trenches, and even very shallow trenches would keep them perfectly safe from the shrapnel. So in summary, the British had two problems. A lack of promotions in the artillery meant that they never got the best officer candidates, and they came to rely heavily on shrapnel. Both of these would be a problem in 1914, but they would not be the only ones. Much like the Germans, the British believed that the number one role of the artillery was to support the infantry at close range. This meant that the artillery was often broken up into batteries and sections and sent forward into the front lines. It was believed that once the guns were there, they could provide a great moral effect on both the British infantry and their enemy. A key part of this moral effect on the enemy was to suppress enemy fire to help the infantry gain fire superiority before they pressed home their attack. In this way, the artillery was treated as simply a bigger gun. To try and coordinate all of this artillery, spread out as it was with the infantry, was the job of the Commander Royal Artillery, or the CRA. The CRA was a divisional position, but they only had a tiny staff, with a total of only three signalers, three orderlies, and two bicyclists. When the guns were broken up by battery or sections, or even sometimes single guns, this was not even close to enough men to keep them all under control, and this meant that it was often up to the battery commanders and the associated infantry officers to determine what the artillery should actually be doing. In these matters, the Army Training Manuals, published in 1902 and 1912, had little guidance as to what exactly the artillery and infantry were supposed to do to work together. There was a lot of debate happening in places like the Journal of Royal Artillery, but very few firm guidelines. Since it was drilled into the artillery that they were the subordinate branch, they they ended up doing exactly what the infantry officers needed them to do. They might make a few suggestions, but overall, they just ended up doing what was asked of them. When this was combined with the overall desire to showcase bravery, it would put the artillery in some pretty hairy situations. Then once the fighting began to settle down, they encountered another problem. In the artillery manuals, there was a clear separation between what should be happening during normal field operations and what should happen during sieges. However, the army found itself in a siege in the field, which required the artillery to try and figure out the new situation. This meant that in the early months and years of the war, there was very little hard information on how much artillery would be needed to achieve specific results against specific targets. Uh, They would have to learn very rapidly. That is quite a bit of negativity about the British, so let's turn to something maybe a bit more positive, uh, their guns. The primary workhorse for the British artillery before the war was the 18-pounder. This was the heaviest field gun in use in Europe at the time, when you look at the weight of shell that it could throw down range. However, it combined this with being reasonably light and maneuverable, if a bit less than either of some of the guns used by other countries. This was not really a problem, and while it might have slightly hampered mobility in a mobile war, or in the first few months of the war, it would not end up mattering that much. There was one problem with the 18-pounder, though. It had a very flat trajectory, flat even when compared to other field guns. This trajectory was chosen on purpose, though. It, It wasn't a mistake. And it was chosen because that is the optimal trajectory for firing shrapnel. You want shrapnel to be sweeping along the ground in a group of targets, not just dissipating its energies into the dirt. And this made it much better at the frontline role the British were envisioning. And to this point, all of the guns were equipped with gun shields for protection. Each division was equipped with 54 of the guns, and they would be joined by 18 4.5-inch light field howitzers. These smaller guns were then joined by four 60-pound howitzers, and this was a pretty good number of artillery guns, uh, but they were all outfitted with shrapnel shells, or at least the vast majority of shells they had were shrapnel. This would make them far less impactful than hoped, and it would also limit their range, since shrapnel loses its effectiveness at long ranges, in ways that high-explosive shells do not. 
When the war started, all of these pre-war ideas were executed about as well as possible. When the infantry and artillery found the enemy, the artillery would often deploy in full view of the Germans, a situation that would happen at Mons and Lakateau. In both these cases, the infantry and artillery would be unable to stop the German advance, which when combined with the artillery fire from the Germans would require the artillery to frantically evacuate the area, often suffering heavy casualties in guns, men, and horses. There was certainly no hesitation from the gunners to go forward, and they did some good work when they could, but they were just not in a position where they could resist the German advances. As the line began to settle during and after the race to the sea, the British artillery found themselves in a new arena that they had not really planned for. There was some innovation early on, especially around how the artillery and armies were organized. Now this brought specific artillery batteries out of the army chain of command and assigned them to geographical sectors. And this let the same guns stay in the same place, even if their infantry units rotated out of the line. They might still be moved when concentrating for large attacks, but by leaving the guns in one spot, the logistical issues with the artillery were lessened. There was one problem that they could not get around in the short term, the shell shortage. This was a problem for every country in Europe, and the British were no exception. The British would also make an incorrect assumption near the end of 1914, which would carry into the 1916 battles, which would then carry into 1916 and then 1917 as well. And this was the belief that if they had enough artillery, they could just destroy the German positions, and that would make their attack successful. This was not the case, and it would take them three years to learn that no matter how much artillery they had destroying the German positions, and no matter how many weeks of artillery bombardment they had, it did not guarantee successful attacks. And in fact, it made them more difficult on a strategic level. We now move over to the French. Much of their pre-war French artillery doctrine was driven by a man named Hippolyte Langlois. Langlois was a career officer in the French army, reaching the rank of general. But more importantly, he was a well-regarded military theorist who would write many articles on artillery topics in the decades before the war. He believed that the next war would be one of movement and firepower, and because of this the French needed a gun that would be easy to move around, could fire rapidly, and be used from forward positions in close support of the infantry. These requirements would mean that the guns would have to be small and light, because that was the only way that they would be able to keep up with the infantry. Then, when they got into the line, they would need to be able to put as many shells downrange as possible. Langlois would have a role in working these theories into the French regulations of 1895 and 1913. Perhaps more importantly, Langlois' theories would be the driving force behind the introduction of the French 75 field gun. This gun was a technical marvel. It could fire quickly, its recoil mechanism negated the need for the gun to be re-aimed after every shot, it was small and maneuverable, it was basically the perfect gun for Langlois' tactics. Not only did the 75mm fit perfectly into French tactics, it was also better than what the Germans had. In 1911, Colonel Remy, the director of procurement for the French army, thought that the 75 was vastly superior to anything that the Germans had. Quote, if one compares the 75 with the 77, which constitutes three quarters of the artillery of the German army, it is undeniable that the last is inferior, not just in some details, but in important points, power, stability, and efficacy. One statistic that many arguments would circle around before the war was the weight of shell that could be put on target. Basically, how many pounds or kilos of shells could be put on a specific point on the front over a given period of time. Now, for heavy guns, they could fire bigger shells, but they often did it slower and generally with less accuracy than smaller guns, who could put shells out faster and with greater accuracy but less range. If you assume that each of these shells would do damage proportional to its size, then the calculations are easy. Rounds per minute times weight, uh, with some play in there for accuracy. This was the assumption that Langlois and the French were making when they went with a smaller, more rapid-firing gun. They believed that the battles uh, would happen in the more open, where small shells were just as efficient as larger shells. Unfortunately, on the battlefields of World War I, five small shells does not a heavy shell make. One item that I mentioned when discussing the British would also come into play here, the gun shield. There was a general belief that a gun shield would protect the crews of a gun from infantry fire. This would then allow the guns to be moved as close as possible to the front. 
This belief was true after the Russo-Japanese War, where many first-hand accounts claim that the gun shields on the Japanese guns were successful at providing protection for the gunners. The Russo-Japanese War also seemed to confirm the beliefs of many European countries that direct fire was the best possible use of artillery. During that war, the Russian artillery often had a hard time landing shells on the Japanese because they had a tendency to take up defilade positions out of sight of the enemy, which meant that they had to rely on indirect fire on targets. Similar information would be brought back from the observers of the Balkan Wars, where the Bulgarians had similar issues. While the Russians and Bulgarians had a hard time with this setup, that would not transfer to 1914. Now, while the French loved their 75mm, it did not mean that they did not at least investigate making some larger guns. Before the war, they began the process of developing a new light howitzer, looking for something that could serve the same purpose as the 105mm howitzer that the Germans had. Now, let's talk a little bit about this process of trying to create this new gun. I think it is somewhat informative of the kinds of decisions that were made due to the French beliefs of what the war would be like. When the calls went out for a larger gun, the response was sort of all across the board, at least partially due to the army not knowing precisely what it wanted. The weapons that would arrive for testing ranged from a 120mm howitzer to 120mm cannon to a 170 or 107mm cannon and then some sort of weird like 75, 120mm hybrid gun howitzer that I don't actually have that much information on but it sure sounds interesting. Now, all of these guns had different strengths and weaknesses, and you will note that some of them weren't even howitzers. The commission in charge of choosing the weapon eventually decided on the 107mm uh, cannon, so not a howitzer, uh, which they were looking for, but they also wanted it rebored to 105mm instead of 107 The key point of contention on the commission, and in the French military as a whole, was that they were still stuck on the idea that these guns had to be small enough to travel with the infantry. This put a sort of soft cap on how large any gun could be. Anything that was too large to travel with the infantry would then be shuffled off into the siege gun category, and while the French had some of these larger guns, they were only planned on being used very occasionally, on very specific targets, and was generally not an area that the French felt they needed to spend a lot of money on. When the war began, the 105mm gun, again, not a howitzer, would only be available in small numbers, and they would frantically begin scaling up work on the 155mm howitzer that they also had plans for sitting around. So in summary, when the war started, the French had exactly the kind of gun they thought they needed to win the war, the 75, a fast-firing, easy-to-move, accurate field gun. This was precisely what Langlois wanted the French to have, and the French doctrine was built around its capabilities. Obviously, the opening battles of the war did not quite go according to plan, and by October the French were already scrambling to adapt. Every heavy gun in France, many outdated, old, and obsolete, were brought forward to the front and joined with the 75 and 105mm guns to try and provide enough firepower. Our topic next week will be how the armies of Europe went from the situation in 1914 uh, to the situation in 1916. None of them were truly prepared for what they would face in 1914, so the key would be adaptation, and that will be our focus.